I'm so excited to be here and to um, introduce you all to one of my favorite people, Jonathan Sandlifer. But before I begin, I want to take just a couple of minutes and introduce myself, provide a bit of context. Well, some of you have been here for all of the webinars I've offered since uh, April 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. Others of you, this is your first time. Yay to those of you who are regulars and welcome to those of you who are first timers. I hope you know how much I value your participation. It's so important to me. I started these webinars because all my in-person events got canceled and I missed spending time with writers. You're my tribe. You are my community. And I uh, love how you interact with one another. I value your comments. I do read them all at the end of the webinar. So feel free to chat with one another. I've given you a brief update on New York City each time uh, that we have one of these webinars, but I'm not going to do that anymore because I've moved. Yes, it's true. So hello from beautiful Southwest Florida, where I am now in residence. Each month I show you a garden or something in a garden, and I'm going to continue doing that. And let me share my screen and you will see an angry egret. Yes, it's true. He was very angry. And let me share my screen. So here is that angry egret. I mean, look at him. I, I, I know I'm projecting that I have no scientific basis for snake and egrets get angry. But I mean, look at him. I know what I know, and he got really mad at me when I called him a sweet little boy. He started coming charging me. My husband, who is an animal whisperer, stepped in front and cooed at him and told him he was a handsome big boy, and he stopped chasing me and started preening. I, I mean, you can tell me that he's just looking for his next meal, and maybe he thought I had some food, or you know, maybe he thought I was food, but I know what I know. He's given me the hard eye, and the lesson I've learned, my takeaway, is that never again will I call him Egret, a sweet little boy. Just saying. So, because I enjoy spending so much time with you, and so many of you have kindly written and told me how much these webinars mean to you, I am delighted to announce the next three webinars. We're already booked through July, but here are the next three. Anatomy of Charmer, Secrets to Crafting Characters Readers Can't Resist. That'll be in February. Saturdays is Crafting uh, Evocative Prose, uh, Secrets of Captivating Storytelling. You know, it's all about we writers have to be good at so many different things, right? From coming up with ideas to uh, setting and character and plot. And, of course, prose. The writing has to be good. So we'll talk about the nuts and bolts of sentence-level writing. And then in April, plotting perfection, overcoming sagging middles with really uh, escalating conflict is what it all comes down to. Uh, the Mystery Mastermind um, workshop is has sold out, and if you're interested in learning more or considering it for the next go-around, which I think will be in the spring, you know, it's five people, six sessions every two weeks, where we work on your novel together, um, please do get on the insiders list. I should also mention that um, I have YouTube shorties, uh, one to three minute answers to frequently asked questions. Uh, we send out a new one every Wednesday, um, and you're just more than welcome to uh, take a look at them at your convenience and uh, do subscribe to the channel. It opens up features that lets us make the videos even more valuable for you. And of course, uh, my special guests, which are every January and June, 
Uh, their full videos are up on the YouTube channel as well. Um, and Jonathan will be up there shortly. So the last thing I should mention in this section is that I have a new book, Beat the Bots, a writer's guide to surviving and thriving in the age of AI. And one of the things I've done in that book, I'm very excited about it, it'll be out in December, is I asked professionals in the field for their insights into what it is they do that artificial intelligence that a bot can't replicate. And uh, they were so generous with their thoughts and insights, including Jonathan. Um, you know, I just finished his wonderful book, The Lost Van Gogh, which we'll be talking about. And I was really focused on setting because that was the tip he gave me, was how to create the verisimilitude of setting in a sentence or two. You know, what I always refer to as the world in a word. And we'll talk more about that. And so many pro tips that I think just make the book so very valuable. We are planning a major uh, social media TikTok promotion when the book comes out. And I'm going to be asking for your help on various things. Stay tuned for that. So obviously, you know, I write both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, my two nonfiction books, Mastering Suspense, Structure, and Plot, and Mastering Plot Twists, both won the Agatha Award. As a teacher, I'm a member of the full-time faculty of Lehman College, part of the City University in New York, all online now that I'm here. And I run loads of workshops like this for MFA programs and associations and uh, writing groups and clubs. And if you're a member of a group, please do get in touch. I love to work with you. I'm also the chair of the Black Orchid Novella Award, which is one of two awards given out by the Wolfpack. This one is in cooperation with Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine. Um, it's a novella, no entry fee, um, details. I'm sure John is giving you the link for all the details, but we welcome it. We're in our new cycle. Deadline's May 31st, so please do participate. And the other award is the Neural Award that's given out by the uh, Wolfpack. And I mention that in particular because Jonathan is one of the recipients and we're pretty excited about that. So it is now time to jump into Reinvent Your Writing and Yourself, discussing the writing process with best-selling author Jonathan Sadlifer. And it is my great pleasure to introduce my special guest, Jonathan Sadlifer. Jonathan is a writer and an artist. His debut novel, Death Artist, was an international bestseller translated into 17 languages. Fourth novel, Anatomy of Fear, won the Nero Award. Yay! And his most recent novel, The Last Van Gogh, is the center second entry into his new series. And The Lost Van Gogh hit the U.S. Times, U.S. Today, sorry, U.S. Today, bestseller list within the first week of publication. Go, Jonathan. Yay. So exciting. The book features artist Luke Perron and the great-grandson of the man who stole the Mona Lisa. As an artist himself, Jonathan has quite a history, a history that led to his becoming a writer, and that's where I'd like to start. So Jonathan, if you want to turn on your camera and join us, welcome. My first question to you is about your path to publication including your early experience as an artist, then your retreat to Italy, then finding your way to writing. Hi, Jane. It's so great to see you and to be here. Thank and you so much. And I should say, because you're not reporting from New York, that it's sunny skies and frigid, frigid, like 14 degrees or something. Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> so, I've been traveling on a book tour all over, and I've been one step ahead of all the bad weather all the way. I've kind of just, and then I made it home, and then I leave again. So anyhow, um, well, my path to 
publishing is, is I think you know, I'm a little bit odd, a little circuitous. I had, I wasn't an artist. Um, I went to art school, and um, which I loved. I loved, and I became a quite serious artist, and I did that. Um, and then about uh, 25 years ago, gosh, is it that long? Maybe, yeah. Um, I was having a little retrospective exhibition um, in Chicago, and they collected 10 years of my artwork from gal from museums and collectors, and they took my my newest six paintings. And that show opened on a Friday, and the building burned to the ground the very next day. So I lost 10 years of artwork overnight. Now, I have to say, Jane, in retrospect, um, nobody died. Uh, I, you know, yes, these were objects I cared about and people cared about, which was nice. But, you know, I've come to look at it in many different ways. One, that it was just stuff. It was okay. And the other thing is that it gave me a second life because what happened is that after that fire, I started to reevaluate why I had become an artist. You know, it, I, honestly, I did that. I love art. And when I was a boy, I, I didn't think I was really good at anything except drawing. I could always draw, but I was not a good student. I found out when I got to art school that I was dyslexic, which is why I couldn't read and I wasn't a good student. But after the fire, you know, I was invited to the American Academy in Rome and I went there as a visiting artist and I had a lot of trouble painting. I did a lot of drawing, but I couldn't really concentrate. So I started a novel and that's really, you know, how it, my life changed. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to recommend a fire. But I will say, I will say that I was on a course. You know how we all are and we have these ideas about creating our lives. I would not have changed that course in any way. And I love the life that I received, you know, that I changed my route. Um, I did both for a long time. I still draw every day and I, I, I do paint. But I really chose at a certain point to have this second life, this second career as a writer. And um, I love it. I really love it, you know? So, yeah. You chose crime fiction. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> well, first of all, I love it. You know, I grew up as a boy. I loved Ed Brown Poe. And I think I read every Ed Brown Poe uh, story poem. I remember in my bookshelves as a, a boy having that thick, thick anthology of Edgar Allan Poe. The other thing is that I got the Hardy Boys every month. And um, because I had trouble reading the Hardy Boys, it would take me weeks to read those books. But I, I loved those books. I really loved the adventure and the mystery and then what happened when I was in Rome and writing that novel, it was a very serious novel that I was writing. And I don't know if I've ever told you this, maybe, but it was a serious novel about, oh goodness, about an artist who lost all his work and was very depressed. And I, Brittany, I wonder where you got the idea, John. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I'll tell you this, Jay. I got back to New York after a year and I read those like, 200 pages. And my feelings were, I really don't like this character. I don't like this guy. He's entitled. He's whiny. He's, you know, and so what I did was I killed him on the page. I really killed him. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and then it, it came to me like, oh, this is what I want to do. And I threw that book away. I abandoned it. And I started a new novel, which became The Death Artist. And it was a thriller, you know. Um, and it was a, a big surprise to me because I, I had written for <clears throat> art journals. I'd written cultural pieces, nonfiction pieces. I'd never written a novel. It took me years to write that novel and to get it to work. And then 
How uh, many years? Hmm. Hen? That's, that's great for folks to know. Yeah. I mean, I remember at one point, I, I would print out a copy, and I had this tall, like, you know, taller than I am uh, file cabinet, and I had filled it with hard copies of the novel, which where the title had changed, where this had changed. I mean, I saved two of them, which the Library of Congress has, but... Most of them I shredded because, you know, they weren't very good. Um, but anyhow, I was very lucky. I was at the arts colony Yado, Y-A-D-D-O, in upstate New York, which is for writers, composers, visual artists, performance artists, 200 years old. And it's just extraordinary. I was there painting during the day and writing at night on this novel. <clears throat> and so... I was tired, but it was like great tired. And I became friends with writers at Yado. Um, and before I left, I, I gave hard copies to eat two different writers. And then I ran away. I went home. And one of them loved the book and gave it to her agent. And her agent called me and said, can you come in and see me? And I said, sure. And... Um, she said, first she said, I love the title. She said, now. And then she said, <laughs> she said a list of things. But what she said that was most interesting and is interesting as a something for writers to think about. She said, you know, what happens in your book is it's kind of a whodunit. And we find out on page 340 really what is happening. And who the person is. And she said, I want you to give us that on page 10. Because it will change the entire, what it will do. I didn't really know the difference then. It will change your book from a whodunit to a thriller. The reader will know right away that there's a lunatic on the loose. A psychopath who is, we don't totally know his reasons, but we meet him immediately. And we see how crazy he is and why he sort of, and you learn more and more and more as we go through. Um, but she said, you need to do that. Um, I said, well, you know, if I take something from the end of my book and put it up front, it will, I have to rewrite the whole book. And she said, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> and she said, go home and, we'll, and fit, do that and bring it back to me in one week. She said, and we will put your daughter through college. That was the words. And I went home. I was teaching. I didn't, I called in sick for a week. I wrote from morning till night. I rewrote the book. I, in a week? In a week. Yeah. I was, I was like, you know, and bug eyed and insane. And I tweeted <laughs> her the book. She read it. She wanted me to make three little tiny changes. I did that very quickly she sold the book on a like i gave it to her she sold it like four days later and you know it was a, such a shock because it was a big success i don't even know nobody was more surprised than i was and you know it, it you know a lot of people i think were interested in this artist i had a reputation as an artist who had written a novel and it and it took place in a world I know in the New York art world. Um, and I think a couple of things, you know, it's never one thing, you know, this chain, but, a, but a, conf a conflation of things, but people magazine chose it as their page turner of the week. And they gave it this great like spread. And then some other things, the New York times Sunday magazine called to interview me. And so I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. It was just like it was happening to somebody over here. But that book was very successful. And so then I got a contract to write two more books. That was a bigger surprise because I thought, oh, my gosh, now what? You know, <laughs> um, so I didn't really expect that. So that was my path to writing. A heck of a path. Yeah. Well, before we get into the nitty gritty of uh, your process, which I know something about and I find equally fascinating. 
Um, talk a little bit about writing a memoir, because you also have written a memoir. That's wonderful. Thank you. I, I did. Um, it was a book I didn't want to write, you know. Um, <clears throat> I didn't... Uh, well, what happened was that uh, my wife, of many years, uh, died very suddenly um, in my arms. Um, she died in a matter of minutes, and I was just thrown out of my life, out of my mind, out of my life. Um, I couldn't write at all. I just couldn't write at all. And what I did, because I felt so disconnected from my life, was I did something I had never done. I, I kept a journal. And in my journal, I would literally write down every... At the, I would do it at the end of the day. I would write down everything that happened in my day. And I did this to kind of hold on to a kind of reality about what was going on. I'll tell you, Jane, and I think you might understand this, the thing that kept me the most sane was that I was teaching. And I would go to my job. Um, I, was te I taught writing in the Pratt Institute writing program. And my students didn't know what had happened in my life, and I didn't tell them. But three days a week, I had to pull myself together, you know, shave, put on a nice shirt, and go and teach. And it it was a great thing because for those hours, I was, you know, with my students and it was great. But what happened was I, I couldn't really write a novel. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't work on my books. And um, I went to Yaddo again. This was years later, many years later. And But I didn't think I could go. I, except for teaching, I, I didn't socialize at all. I did very little. Um, the director of Yaddo knew me and knew my wife and called me up and said, come to Yaddo. It's a nurturing place. We'll take care of you. It could make me cry just think, you know, thinking about that. It's so wonderful. So I went to Yaddo. And what I got there, and I was supposed I had an old book contract that I hadn't fulfilled, and I tried, I couldn't do it. And I started transcribing my diaries during my year. It was at that point it was about six or seven months. And I just started transcribing them and just thinking about them as writing in some way. And I did show them to the director, who was a friend. I said, would you look at this and see? And the next, I gave them to her at the end of it, like at 4 o'clock. And the next morning, she emailed me to say, well, I've been crying and laughing all night, but I, you, ha you have something here. You should keep going. And when I left Yaddo, my friend, I've been very blessed with wonderful writer friends like you and a very, you know, I think the writing community and is so supportive, actually, in a way the art community is not. Um, one of my good friends is, is the writer Joyce Carol Oates, I think you know. And Joyce had written a memoir of her husband's death, the, uh, uh, um, the Widow's, I can't remember now what it was called, Widow's Book. Anyway, a very art-wrenching book. And... I told her what I was doing, and she said, can I read? And I said, I'd love you to, because I don't know that I'm going to finish it. <clears throat> and she she read it over a weekend, and she called me up, and she said, Johnny, you have to write this book. Not just because I think it's good and moving, but because men rarely write these kind of books. And so I did. I mean, I had a couple of cheerleaders helping me. They were all women, by the way, helping me write the, you know. And I published the book. And the, the Widower's Notebook. The Widower's Notebook, yeah. And by the way, Joyce Carol Oates and I then went on a small book tour. <laughs> we were like, I said, we're the widow and the widower. Oh, my God. <laughs> but, you know, it was very interesting. And people would come up to me. And they still write to me, Jane. I get emails. I just got a long email from someone the other day saying, 
thank you for putting into words things I couldn't say. That's what makes me happy I wrote that book. You know, mm. I, I hear from people all the time. You know, I don't know. It got very well. It was very well received. And I think it was the New Yorker said it read like a thriller. So I realized, oh, that structure is in my mind. I don't even think about it. They also said that there were some of the funniest things in that they'd ever read in a grief memoir. And I, at the time, I was shocked to read that. I was shocked. Uh, I never reread my book after that. But then people would tell me, oh, that scene with X. And I thought, oh, my God, did I actually keep that in there? Um, but Yeah, know, the, the, the scene of you running out without your underwear. That's uh, 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 don't, 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 don't tell, don't tell. Um, you, I think it's all the worst, but it, you know. <laughs> but you know, tragedy and comedy, they're very close, yeah. very close companions. And, um, you know, um, so yeah, so I wrote that book and I, it was a very hard book to publish because it was very exposing. Yeah. Uh, but I was, when I get these emails and letters from people, I feel like, okay, it was a good thing to do. Oh, I, I, a dear friend of mine, a widower, was so appreciative. I sent him a copy, and yeah, it, it meant something to me. Yeah. All right, let's switch gears and talk about writing fiction. Let's focus on the process. Yeah. Um, so you have a new series featuring Luke yeah. with girlfriend Alex and Interpol um, analyst Smith right. as the three protagonists. Um, I was interested in this one in particular, The Lost Van Gogh, um, because my first book in my Josie Prescott Antiques Mystery Series also focuses on art stolen by the Nazis. Right. There's, you know, it's a rich, ripe field for investigation and filling in the blanks. Um, and I was interested in, I'm sort of jumping ahead a little bit. That's right. But the first book, um, the... Last Mona Lisa was set in Italy. Here we're in Amsterdam, and you teased India in your author's note. <laughs> so let's just go there. Is that book in process? Are you doing it? Yes, that book is in process, but I'm not going to India. Oh, where are you going? Well, I think I'm going to Palermo. Oh, well, look, we're going back to Italy. Yeah, you know what I, I would love to live in Italy. I just love Italy so much. It's like in my blood. Um, India, I mean, India is just. It's. I had never gone. I just went last year, and I went for a long kind of not long, but you know, several weeks, and it was just the most amazing. And there's so much more to see in India, and it. It's filled with mystery and exoticism and beauty and such nice people and very welcoming. And so I wrote that note because I had just come home from it. <laughs> and I thought, I have to go back. But you know, it's it's a big trip to go to India. And I would like to set something there, you know, um, be my own Henry James with less words. But I don't, I think the book I'm writing there's a reason I'm going to I'm going to Palermo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is is it under contract? Are you? It, it it's well. Right now we're discussing a two book deal, and and one will be a ser the series, and one will not. Oh, because I I have some other I I have some other things I've been working on, and I would like to do them as well. So. What a great position to be in! That's just wonderful. Well, you know. I've been, you know, I've had my share of, you know, good, bad, ugly, but yeah. I feel very blessed. I feel very blessed. So, well, yeah, but we, I mean, uh, good fortune, you know, fortune favors the bold. And you are bold, you are brave, you have overcome diversity like most of us hopefully we'll never experience, and I want to acknowledge that. Well, you know, it's funny. One of my, my very good friends, uh, 
He, he said, you know, Johnny, when I think of you, I think of one of those inflatable clowns that you can knock down and it bounces back up. You bounce back after the fire. You bounce back after Joy's death. And I said, well, you know, I think I, I have to say that I grew up in a family where my father was an incredible hard worker. That's all he did <laughs> was work. My mother um, also worked hard. Both of my parents came from poor families, so they had pulled themselves up from their bootstraps and worked very hard, and they really believed in hard work. And I have always found my, for a bit, lack of a better word, salvation in work. I love to work. It, it, it takes me out of myself. Um, I enjoy the process of, of different kinds of work. Um, I, be, I also think, Jane, and I, I think you might agree, that, and I say this to my students often, if you pursue something and work and continue, you will achieve that. You know, it's a matter of putting your mind to it and really working. A student of mine, a writing student, is nominated for an Edgar for his short story. I, you know, I work, I try and get all my students, you know, I try to get them agents and I am so excited. I realized yesterday, I'm not nominated for an Edgar, I don't care. <laughs> you know, one of my students, it just, it made me so proud and so happy. Where are you teaching now? Well, this was from um, the Center for Fiction and it was a group of writers that I worked with for a number of years, the same group. Uh, so this is one of those writers. Are you, are you still teaching? At the moment, I haven't taught for the last like year and a half. You know, I retired actually at Pratt simply because, you know, I miss my students like crazy. I don't miss academia that much, to be honest, but I do miss my students. So maybe, yeah, I'm thinking how I can do that. It's time because I love that interaction and I love, I've always loved teaching. I really love, I think it's just one of the greatest jobs, you know, you can have. So. All right. Now some nitty gritty questions. Yeah. Do you plot? I plot as I go along. <clears throat> I do not outline a book. Um, here's the way I work. I have a variety of thoughts of some that I feel like those two or three main threads can create a book. Um, so with The Lost Van Gogh, I had the idea of the fantasy that everybody wants, going to a flea market, finding a painting, buying it for $25, and it turns out to be something extraordinary. But that coming with that extraordinary thing is very unexpected and rather frightening consequences. So I had that idea to play with. Uh, and the other idea I, I wanted to play with was art restitution, which is very big now and very important issue, very big moral issue in our world. I wasn't sure how that was going to work, I, but I knew they had to play together, Jane. You know that. They, they have to be, you know, all leading toward the same thing. So... I did what I always do, which is I started writing. I just start writing um, with what I think might be the beginning. And uh, then I stop and I see what it is. And then I make a bunch of notes. And I, if it doesn't feel like it's going anywhere, I might jettison it. If it feels like it has potential, I will then make some notes about a, a little bit of a structure. Like both of these books, The Last Mona Lisa and The Lost Man Go, have a very similar structure, which is a story in the past and a story in the present. That the story in the past is a smaller thing that weaves through. In The Lost Man Go, it's the story of this lost painting, you know, from basically the book starts in 1944 at the very end of the war in Paris. It doesn't give much away since it's the first page, but somebody is painting over painting. But my, my story in the past goes further back. 
because it goes back to Van Gogh's funeral and the painting. And then we trace it, um, and as you said earlier, how it is a painting that was stolen by the Nazis, and then how that painting moves from Paris in 1944 to the Nazis, to ultimately upstate New York, and ultimately to Luke and Alex in New York. So the story in the past joins up with the story in the present. Um, as I work, I'll say this, as I'm working on my computer, I have a yellow legal pad next to me, and I write lots of notes, and I create a kind of ongoing outline. So every day I have, and I, it, it's crazy, but I, I rewrite it every day on my little pad. I'll start a new chain because things move around. And it's literally chapter one, and I always have the timeline next to it, you know, day one, um, New York, uh, and then I keep going. Day four. Is and... that on a separate yellow pad? or yes, it's on a separate pad. So you have two pads, yeah. one with notes, and the other with the timeline. No, no. Uh, no, that is, I'm sorry, all on one legal pad um, with a kind of ongoing outline in which I'm listing my scenes and I'm writing a timeline. I have a little, I always have a little bar on the side, which I write timeline. I think this is essential if you're writing a novel. You must know where you are in time because otherwise you're going to end up and the reader's going to be like, wait a minute, did they sleep? What happened? I mean, isn't it nighttime? Isn't it, you know, so you, that changes for me because I reorder things. And ultimately, I end up with a, and I scotch tape my pages together of the legal pad. So I'll end up having like a scroll of 20 pages. And then I simplify that. And then when I have a full draft, I take every scene and I write it on an index card. And I spread those out if they can fit on my table. And not chapter, every scene. And I look at those and I look for things like, are there three scenes in a row with Luke doing something? Are there three scenes in a row that have to do with police work? Are there two, you know, so that you realize, you know, a novel is like a symphony. You know, you, you, you can't have three chapters in a row that are playing the same note. It's just not, it's just not going to work or it's not going to be fun for the reader. And so I look at them and I literally, it's very flexible. I move those scenes around and I think, oh, I could move this scene that's the 28th scene. It could become the 16th scene all I need to do is change the intro slightly before it, in the chapter before it. And I do that a lot, a lot. And then I, um, when I have a probably my third or fourth draft, <clears throat> I reread it again, I look at it, and I try and see what's missing. The repetitive notes, but also what's missing. Um, has... Alex, see, it's Luke, who is my my bad boy with a bad past, who found himself through art. His girlfriend, who I hate to just call her his girlfriend because she's brilliant, she's an art historian, she's very accomplished, but she's she also has she seems to have have had the perfect life, you know, kind of rich, Upper East Side, New York, private school, but in fact, her father was a huge art criminal, was very abusive to her mother, then deserted the family. So her life was not so rosy either. And then John Washington Smith, who's my the Interpol agent, who's an integral, very important character to me. And I have to look at that and just see, have I, have I given them enough? And I, have I given the reader, you know, where, where is it that I can cut? I always cut. You know, at one point, The Lost Van Gogh was 670 pages. It is now... Shoot me now. Let's see. Oh, my God, yeah. It is now 311 pages. 
So that's that's more than half. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of it just had to go. You know, less is more. Okay, two questions. One is, Luke is a first-person narrator. Right. Everybody else is third person. Right. How did you decide on that? And do you, does it work? I mean, obviously it works. I'm asking the wrong question. Why did you do that to have one of the three important characters be the first person narrator? It's a great question because in fact, it's, it's very tricky to switch your point of view. And I don't necessarily recommend it. I have not necessarily done it in other books, but I have done it in these two books. I did it because I, I wanted one person to kind of be telling the story and Luke was my main character now interestingly I'll get back to your question but in an interesting way um, I think The Last Mona Lisa is Luke's book very much with these other main characters The Lost Van Gogh to me becomes John Washington Smith's book to me in the middle of the book I could see he was running away with the book He's the character who takes the biggest risk, the most life-threatening risks. And I just thought, okay, he can do it. He can take it. I love him. He's great. Um, but I wanted also to be able, you know, to be able to see everybody's actions. You have to be writing in the third person. But I, I thought, I tried, by the way, to do it all in the third person originally. And it was not as effective because I didn't feel as close to Luke as I wanted the reader to feel. Now, I think when you switch points of view, it has to, your reader should not be jolted. You know, they, they, they just have to move with it quite naturally. I mean, sometimes I think it's challenging. Um, for me, it became very natural in these books. And I liked it. I liked doing it. Thank you. Uh, next question. Yeah. Back to the time change. Yeah. How did you, first of all, I know that your scenes are on white index cards, except for the past, which are on green index cards. <laughs> so that you can see at a glance yes. whether you're current or past. Right. I think that was very clever. Um, how do you decide when to insert the past? That is a, a very important question. Um, the way I believe it has to work is at a natural moment when the reader is thinking, well, how did that happen? And then boom, you give them this little piece of information. Here's the painting in 1960 something. And then See, the past and the, if you're writing two different time periods, what the, they have to inform each other. So I would find natural breaks in the contemporary story, which is the main story, when I felt like the reader needs to know something. I also would tell, will tell you that if they didn't see, I knew, I knew in my head, okay, it's time for, to go back and learn something about how the painting moved. If it didn't flow perfectly from the chapter, well, you go back and you rewrite that chapter before so that it, at the end of it, it, there's a couple of sentences that set up going into the past. You know, this is your job. Your job is to help your reader move fluidly without thinking through those periods. It's also, I think, a wonderful example of handling backstory because it's all backstory. And yet you do it in the present moment. You have said we're now 1944, and now it's written as if it is happening now. It's, it's in a sense, a historical novel yeah. the plot line that's woven through. And I thought that really worked well as opposed to telling us things. Every bit of it was showing. And the, the, I just, the ending is really fabulous. Um, it really uh, ties everything together in a very unexpected and yet fitting and suitable way. So, yeah, on you. You know, I want to say something about that. I don't in 
<clears throat> any kind of crime fiction where you're going to have to tie up some things, if it is, it should be unexpected, surprising, but inevitable. Do not tell me out of nowhere that you know somebody has did all these things because if you if you, every the reader should be able to read that and go oh wow but of course i <clears throat> because he he or she they set this up very subtly you know you cannot cheat your reader you did she and but you don't do that at the very beginning that just is one of the things that evolves as you're writing which exactly the um this this surprising yet inevitable ending i think i'm always building toward it <clears throat> you know i don't write my ending first i know people who do i have an idea i have many ideas in my head and i have many notes about the ending um but i don't write it and i don't write it because there are many different kinds of endings you know there's for me I usually have kind of a big climactic, you know, ending, and then I have a quieter coda after it because I like that because I think life is like that, you know, something happens and then you have to look at it and you have to think about it. What did this mean? What, what did I learn or what does it tell me? And, you know, it's different. It is of course different in life because books, books can be perfect. You know, they can can make things the way you want them to be. That's why I love writing books and writing, you know, so. Okay, this reminds me of a wonderful quote from Tom Clancy, who stated, the difference between life and fiction is that fiction has to make sense. Yes, that's right. Life is chaotic. It's unexpected. You know, I've learned over the course of my life that you can't control your life. You can do a lot of things, which you know what I mean, to to focus your life, to stay on track, to be disciplined, but you cannot predict your life. Yeah, it's true. I have one more question that I want to ask, and then we'll open it up to questions, sure. and John will be doing that. And we'll stay a little bit after two, if that's all right, just to make sure there's a little bit of time for folks. Um, and my question has to do with setting. Um, you wrote a wonderful um, dis explanation, description, um, your thoughts on setting for Beat the Bots. But I came on this line in your book, in my edition, which is the trade paper. It's on page 238. And Alex is um, in a town... She has just arrived in the town in France. Alex shook him off and walked into the square she had seen in photos, larger than she imagined, like a little park, trees dotting its perimeter, its focal point, the town hall, the Hotel de Ville, square and white with French flags flapping from the second story balcony. And the idea that it was different from photos is essentially what you said, yeah. that Talk a little bit about getting setting right. Sure. Um, I, I have a lot of little things to say about that or big things or whatever they are. But I believe, number one, um, I think I'm a very visual writer and it's probably my background as an artist and going to art school. And I think in pictures, I, I always have changed. And I've learned a lot from film. You know, I love movies. and But... Despite what anybody tells you, do not write about a place if you haven't been there. And don't think you will get that place by going online and looking at pictures. You will not. You will get it wrong. And I, I've, I'm a huge, not just believer, like an enforcer of if you are going to set something somewhere, you have to go there. You have to see what it, not just what it looks like, what it smells like, what it sounds like, what the people are like in that moment, you know? Nothing knocks me out of a book quicker because I'm, I'm, you know, born in New York. I know it really well. I'm reading along in a book and somebody has a street 
a car going the wrong way on a one-way street. And I'm thinking, number one, how lazy. They, that they could look up. But, you know, I'll give you, you know, Luke also, when he comes to Amsterdam, he talks about it's not like he imagined because he pictured it to be small, pictured it to be little castles and fairy tales. And in fact, Amsterdam is a very bustling cosmopolitan city with streetcars and cars and taxis and bicycles. And it's very chaotic. Um, and I would never have gotten that, you know, when I wrote the last Mona Lisa. So I had the last, what I thought was the last draft. I gave it to my agent. My agent was a random house editor for 20 years. So she's really good. And she read it and she said, you know, it's 99. Then she dropped back. She said, it's 92% there. But I think you could use more color in Florence. And she said, when was the last time you were in Florence? And I said, it's been a few years. But, you know, this is the difference. I was in Florence. I lived a year in Rome and I went to Florence and I had been there. But I was never there looking at it as a writer and for a purpose. So my agent said that. And my daughter, I said, oh, gee, I don't know if I can go. And my daughter went on my computer, said, where is Luke living when he's in the book in Florence? I said, he's in the Piazza de Madonna. And she went online and she said, I just got you an Airbnb for four weeks in the Piazza de Madonna. And uh, I took a leave from teaching. It was right before the, you know, that was, yes, right before the pandemic. And I went to Florence and I lived in this amazing, like, fourth floor walk up with a roof that overlooked the Duomo. Oh, my God. So great. But I here's the thing, Jane. I had written the book. So I knew all of it. So I had made notes to myself of every single thing everyone went to, everywhere they walked, and I made I made paths every day. I would walk seven or eight miles through Florence to this place, to that place where Luke goes, where Alex goes, where Smith goes. It brought that book to life. So I came home and I not only rewrote those scenes, I had to rewrite the whole book because it changed the whole book. But Wow, and that's the power of setting. Yeah. The setting, you know, you have to very be very careful not to make it a travelogue. You know? I had tons of stuff. In fact, my first draft, I reread it and I went, Oh, this is awful. It's awful. It's a travelogue. And I cut out more than half, probably two thirds of it. And just left the things where I don't describe things, but where somebody sees something. Right. So it's the experiential. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say for if you're a writer, you're traveling, you can take it off your taxes. And like, what is better than that than going to a, you know, I mean, it's not exactly a hardship going to live in Florence for a month. You know, it was That's that, excellent. It was fantastic. So let's open it up to questions. Okay. Okay, we've got quite a few questions in the queue here. I mean, I do want to remind people, if you have to go write it to, that we will be doing a little longer than that, um, but also that you will be able to see a replay of today's discussion on Jane's YouTube, if you would like. Uh, it'll take us a little time to get it put there and, and situated, but uh, janecleland.com forward slash YouTube, take you right over there. If you subscribe and click the little notification bell, it'll let you know exactly when it's live. Um, also, this is one of many events that Jane has hosted and will continue to host one a month. You can find on Jane's website, janecleland.com forward slash events. Um, and of course, if you would like to know more about Jonathan Sandlifer and his books, you can find him at www.jonathansandlifer.com. Um, so yeah, we'll dive into the question queue here. There's quite a few of them, actually. Um, one that seems relevant uh, to get out of the way up front is uh, people wanting to know who is your agent and are they the same agent you've always worked with? Um, no, I just, I, can I just say one thing that I was thinking how much Jane has done for the writing world, you know, and how much she does for students and 
for writing in general and and so she's such a generous person and doing this with other writers and then four other writers i love it no i started with one agent who was a very kind of a super agent who i sell into and she was fantastic and sold my books and she sold um everything up to my memoir what happened was um when my wife died i i just couldn't move forward with my work in the way i had been and so i told my agent that particular agent that i was going to take a break because i didn't think it would be fair to her because she had books a contract lined up for me and i said and she was wonderful she said no i can wait i said no i need a break in my life i need to not feel like things are waiting for me so i left her which most people thought was the most insane thing i had ever done in my life because she's a great agent but i needed to feel not compelled or pushed in a certain way uh, when i finished the memoir what happened was um i i found um i basically gave it to a new agent uh who is continues to be my agent who sold that and sold my last three books so uh, her name is, is jane von muren at avidus uh, creative management and she's an extraordinary person um, one of the things that's really great is that she's also an editor. So she's the first person who reads my work. Excellent. Um, someone mentioned you said you had two ideas you were working on for your upcoming working on a deal with. If you're writing them both at the same time, how does that work for you? Does your process change at all when working on more than one book concept at a time? Um I'm not going to work on them at the same time. What I have done is I've started both. I started them. Um, one of them is a third book in this series, and I've written about 50 pages of it because I knew the beginning. I knew the past part, and I, I know how that's going to play. So I wrote that down, and then I made a lot of notes. And the other book, which is totally different, I kind of just made a lot of pages of notes. And when I write my notes, I do this thing where I just break or in, from the notes, I just break into writing the book, like a couple of paragraphs. So I have that in a separate file. Um, I don't, I'm not going to write them at, at the same time. Um, it will be based on basically what my editor wants me to write first. And I will write that one first um, and then finish it. Uh, and then go to the other book. I, I can, I have trouble writing two things at once. I can write a short story. I could take a break and write a story or an essay for something, but I, I could not write two novels at the same time. I have to live inside that novel and it's, it's a big, dark place sometimes, you know? So, yeah. I like how you described it in the book, Jonathan, again, in your author's note, that it's like falling in a pit and clawing your way out. Yeah. It is. It is. I mean, novels, Jane, I, you, I don't know if you feel like this, but I just think they're really hard because, you know, when I paint, you can see it. You see the whole thing. You can react to it. A novel is in your head. It's, you know, you can't look at it in the same way. So I'm constantly making notes and lists and lists and lists, but it is and I always, I would say, in the middle of my novel, think I'm never going to finish it. I hate it. Um, I'm going to probably jump out the window rather than finish this book or move to, you know, have my fingerprints burned off and move to Argentina. <laughs> I think this every time, you know, so. And I, I, I often, I'm here at my computer and I'll look over and, and see my books and I say to myself, I've done it five times before. I've done it 11 times before. I can do it again yeah. because I'm not a believer. Well, you know, it's so interesting that you say that. I I think the same thing, you know, like 
I mean, my friend S.J. Roseanne, the writer, we just did an event together in Saratoga Springs. And she, and she was really funny. She said, well, she and I complained to her a lot when I'm writing. She said, you have a bestseller. I'm not going to listen to you complain anymore. And I said, oh, yes, you will. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, you will. I said, I listen to you complain. She said, I don't complain as much. She's right. But um, you're right. That thing, you know, you how many you how many books have you written? Novels, fourteen novels. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And yet, there's still that fear, right? Well, it's a certainty. I I have to argue against the certainty of I can't do it. You know, there's a great um, psychiatrist, brain neuro guy, Martinez, something Martinez, who talks about. What you do to help yourself in these situations, you remind yourself that you have done it because then your brain cycles and finds the times and, and helps you with that. If you say out loud or in your brain, I can't do it, your brain cycles through and finds all the times you think you can't do something. So you have- That is 100% true. Um, I participated in a professional development thing on- quantitative analysis, bringing that into writing classes and art classes, everything. And so many people have a math phobia. One of the things we were taught is that we're simply not allowed to let people say, I'm not good at math. Because you have to be in life. You won't get a mortgage. You won't get a credit card. You won't build savings. You've got to be good at math. Yeah. And you know, it's kind of like I get my contracts, my book contracts or my foreign rights contracts or an audio contract. And, you know, they're like 50 pages. I read them. I, you know, my agent's going to, but I have learned to read those. And when I don't understand something, I circle it so that I can ask my agent. And I think you cannot be, you can't be blind. You can't be stupid. You know, this is okay. your, this is your work. So. Good. John, next. Okay. Uh, someone asks, what advice would you give someone who is considering a similar shift from visual to written art? Um, well, I would say, eh, well, first of all, I think you have to really want to do it. I don't think it's something to consider. I think it's something you have to feel compelled to do. If you're not really compelled to do it, you're not going to do it. Uh, but I do think one thing in a practical way is to start because you don't know until you start. If you like doing it, if you like doing it as much, you know, it's very different, of course, the different form between a visual art and a book. A visual art has taught me a lot. Uh, it's also given me tremendous discipline for writing because you have to be very disciplined. Um, but I think you should write write a story. Don't take on a novel right away. Write a story and see see how that feels to you. Um, and, you know, I have a quote over my desk. I have several, but one is from my graduate school painting teacher. And what he said, and I have it typed out, is, Nobody forces you to do this, so don't complain about it. Now, as you heard, I do complain. I don't complain. I whine. It's much, it's much creepier. I whine. But in fact, nobody's going to make you do it. So you have to be very disciplined. You have to treat it like a job. You have to really, you have every day, you have to work every day. You know, uh, it's absolutely essential. So do you write seven days a week? Yes. I, I definitely do. I mean, I take, I mean, I take a lot of time off. I do, you know, I do other things and, um, but I try and work every day in a kind of, yeah, I'll tell you why you never know what's going to be a good day. You might wake up and be in a terrible mood. You might wake up and have a headache, not want to work, but then you sit down and you work and something happens. And, and you never know, you know, you're your own inspiration. If you wait for inspiration, forget it. You're going to be waiting forever. You could be waiting forever. So you have to create that. You have to create a space and a time when all of those things can tap into. You have a process. I know you do, Jane. Every writer does. I get to my desk. 
I re I review and go over everything I did the day before in my writing, and then I lead to the next thing. I do that every day. So it's my process of getting me into what I need to do next. Yeah. Uh, Lee Child um, talks about muscle memory, that you never hear about truck drivers block or nurses block. A truck driver can really, really, really not want to go to work that day, but he gets himself into his cab and latches his belt. And by the time he's a mile or two down the road, this mental muscle memory has taken over. Right. You know, the other thing Lee Child uh, said and said to me, which I love, he said, you know, particularly in, in crime novels, but I think in many novels, you have a question, a book. A novel begins with a, some sort of question, something the reader wants to know. And then you answer it, let's say, after 20 pages. Then there's another thing they need to know. And then you answer then another thing. So your book is a series of what ifs and answers to those questions, which I love. I think about that. You know? Yes, that's yeah. great. Yeah. It also breaks it down into smaller nuggets. So you're yeah. waiting 20 pages or whatever it you is. Know, there's that. Annie Lamott book, Bird by Bird. I've loved yeah. the whole book. I own it. But you know what it's given me? I mean, the, it can be broken down into a sentence. And Bird by Bird means you do, you don't look at the whole thing because it will overwhelm you. You don't look at your whole book. You look at the next chapter, the next paragraph. And I often, when I get overwhelmed with the whole book, all I have to say in my head is Bird by Bird. And it slows me down. I go, okay, just look at that. That's great. Yeah. John? Okay. Someone says, going back to your first and third person narratives mixed together, um, is that something that you find hard to sell to agents and publishers? I personally love to read it, but I worry that since it's not exactly normal, it would be hard to sell as a new author. Um, no, I, I don't think that's true. I think here's what agents or editors are looking for. They're looking for a new, strong, unique voice. That is your voice. Um, th so whether you change points of view, however you do that, now you have to make it feel very natural on the page. That's your job. But no, I don't think that would impede an agent or your ability to get an agent or a publisher. I don't think so at all because... Um, as long as it's not jarring, as long as it feels necessary and uh, unobtrusive and, a way, and the way your story needs to be told. You know, every, every story needs a way to be told, needs to find the right form. And I would recommend this. You have a, let's say, a book or you have a bunch of uh, chapters and they're all written in the third person Try writing one of them in the first person and see if it changes things. Maybe the whole book needs to be in the first person. Maybe the whole book needs to be in the third. I do that, have done that often, where I'll rewrite in a different point of view just to see, is this the right voice? Is this the right voice? So you have to find that. Wouldn't you agree, Jane? I would. I'm, there are reasons that you use third person in particular. It lets you see the broader, the wider lens. Um, and I have, in my Josie Prescott novels are all first person. And that means that the reader can't know anything except what you Josie know. knows at that moment that she knows it. Right. And it's limiting. Well, you know, it's an exchange. The third person, gives you that wide point of view. So the, re the reader can see ev what everybody's doing, what everybody's thinking. But what they don't get, what they get from Josie Prescott, from a first person, is they are really inside that person's head. So it's extremely personal and it's very close. It is limited, but it is very close. So you're, treat you're treating things. No, that's right. And there's an intimacy to it. And every time I come to a chapter, came to a chapter where it was from Luke's point of view, first person, was like, oh, I'm Luke. Well, I want people to feel that. I, I, um, 
it's just uh, it, it evolved. I mean, it just felt totally natural to me. It had to, it had to do that. It had to feel natural. So, and John, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, uh, I'm actually going to kind of blend two because they're related. Um, places, including their cultures and and feeling and moods, change over time. Do you think it's still necessary to go to say Detroit or San Francisco now? If your story is based in 1965, also in the event of things like that or places that just completely don't exist anymore, how do you go about researching a time and place that's no longer accessible? Wow. Huh. That's a great question. I wish Joyce Carol Oates were here to answer that for you because she wrote a recent book called Babysitter and it takes place in Detroit in the 70s. She lived in Detroit in the 70s. I guess you would not have to go back because it is frozen in time and place in your mind and in the world. So that would be very different. I mean, my books are taking place now in the present part of the story. So that's why I do that. If a place doesn't exist at all, I think you're free. You know, you're, you're free to work off your memory and to, and research, you know, so uh, that would be different, I think, than uh, unless you had some reason to go to a place and discover what had changed about that. I mean, I'm kind of curious about something I'm working on, and I'd like to, you know, go and see these things that were, for example, part of Poland that became part of Germany. And I'm curious to see how they but I, I'll never know how they really existed because they, that doesn't exist. And I just want to add a cautionary word to that. Where I really, those of us that like research, we have to be leery to not include all our research. Yeah. Aim for plausibility, not actuality. Um, and yes, you'll get the color and the flavor from the the genuine experience, but don't feel obliged to, in fact, don't. <laughs> like, you know, Jade, that is the greatest advice because it's a trap. You do a lot of research and you're putting it in because you're so excited about it and it's so rich. And I read it and then what it becomes is what we call an exposition dump. <laughs> you are literally telling the reader a whole bunch of research that they do not need to know. You might, you might need to know it because it will inform you. They don't need to know. They can know. I mean, I did a ton of research on degenerate art, which what the Nazis called degenerate art. I basically culled it down to a conversation that's had between this one woman and Luke and John Smith. And we get it all on a page in a little conversation. You have to be very careful about research because it'll stop your book with a thud. You know? <laughs> right? That's exactly right. And Jonathan, I just can't thank you enough for being here. You're so generous with your process and knowledge and approaches. And I, I, it's been great. Me too. I love being here with you, Jane, because I've known you for so long. It's totally comfortable totally easy. I feel like I'm there with you. And it's my pleasure because as I said, I think you give back so much to the writing world, you know? Thank you very much, Jonathan. And on that note, everybody, I hope I'll see you in February. Um, take care if you're in one of those cold places to stay warm. And um, as always, I hope you find great strength and solace from reading and writing. Thank you.